Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hey everyone, thank you for joining me today. The increasing body of scientific evidence related to the brain-gut intersection highlights the important role of behavioral health interventions like stress reduction in managing IBD symptoms and conditions. GI psychologists are key to helping patients and providers understand this link between the brain and the gut, including the impact of stress on IBD. Now today we're joined by Dr. Stephen Loop, who is a clinical psychologist in the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute in the Department of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. His clinical and research interests include integrated care, chronic pain, disease prevention, intervention, acceptance, and commitment therapy. Now, I just want to welcome you, Dr. Loop, for um, coming on and joining us for this episode today. Thank you. Glad to be here. So we're going to just jump right in, and I'm just going to ask you straight up, when someone is first diagnosed with IBD, what are some of the most common feelings and reactions for a patient and or their loved ones who are just diagnosed with this inflammatory bowel disease? Sure. You know, I was just having this conversation with one of our nurse practitioners. One of the most frustrating things for patients who are diagnosed with IBD is we immediately want to figure out why this happened, like what happened here. And, you know, unfortunately, from our treatment team perspective, we don't have a ton of real concrete answers. We don't really know the exact why people develop um, IBD. We know it's this combination of things, including psychological stress, environmental factors, genetic factors, and it's all of it when the uh, like almost like perfect soup of it like forms in someone that they can develop either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So usually there's that why, and I need to figure out why this is happening. Um, that's a pretty normal human emotion to figure out why I'm, why this is going on. Um, the other thing, you know, there's almost a grief reaction a lot of times to some of this, like, you know, what does this mean for my life? Um, and people will be, go through normal stages of like grief where they become sad or they become angry and they go back and forth. So really supporting people, making sure they have the best information that we can give them as a team is usually the best way of handling this and allowing them to, space to have whatever feelings they're having about this so they can adjust to this new diagnosis and try to guide them with the best information we have on what it means going forward. No, that's really important because people sometimes they, even if they're healthy and they take good care of themselves and they find out they have a condition like IBD, and you can explain briefly what that is for those listeners who may not know, but there might be some guilt or some shame around that because they think they take care of themselves so well. And then to have this diagnosis, it can be a little crushing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not uncommon at all for me to work with people who there is a lot of self-blame that they're trying to figure out what did I do that caused this? I think that's one of the things I'm very cautious about as a GI psychologist is I never want people to have the message that they did this to themselves in that like they've worried themselves or their anxiety did this um, or that, you know, they've stressed themselves out to the point where they've developed inflammatory bowel disease. And to step back to what you're saying, inflammatory bowel disease usually means one of two conditions, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And that really captures where the intestines it's affecting, ulcerative colitis being confined to the colon and Crohn's disease can be anywhere from the mouth all the way through. You know, and I'm very cautious about that. Like I said, making sure that people understand, no, there's probably about 50 causes of either of these diseases. And, you know, a lot of them, we don't have any control over, you know, I can't change who mom and dad were and who grandma and grandpa were. And if there was some genetic component, we can't change, you know, there's some research that links the position of the part of the world you live in. There's more incidents of uh, IBD in the Northern hemisphere than the Southern hemisphere. And so there's, there's all these other components that are, you know, feed into developing the diagnosis of IBD. And we don't really have the exact answer for what is the cause it seems like it's probably more of all of these causes um, that go into developing a condition like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And this is so important because not more often than not, a gastroenterologist or other healthcare provider may not have the time or training in behavioral health 
to, to help patients in this area. And I'm so glad in the last several years that behavioral health and GI psychology in particular has gotten more visibility and really, we're really getting to a better understanding of the role of professionals like yourself in the care of patients on a multidisciplinary care team. So can you explain a little bit about your role in working with patients uh, with GI conditions? Sure. My role, you know, I always break it down to we have our physicians, uh, we have our nursing staff, and along with physicians, our advanced practice providers, sort of like nurse practitioners, physicians assistants to see our patients. We have our dietitians, and then we have our GI psychologists here at the Cleveland Clinic. And so we want to look at people as like a global system that all of these things are affecting it. Like I was saying, with the causes of inflammatory bowel disease, we think there's all of these causes that are going on. And we're trying to address those as much as possible. So when I meet with the patient, I, I always say, you know, your physician is doing exactly what they are so trained in the biochemistry of the body and how do we alter the immune system because we know that in like these conditions like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, the immune system is attacking the intestines. So your physician's going to work to kind of figure out what we need to do to alter the immune system or turn down inflammation with steroids. And that's their expertise and they're excellent at it. And then our nutritionist is looking at how are the things we put in our mouth affecting the levels of inflammation, affecting the tube that it all has to travel through? Because it's kind of hard to think that shoving pounds of food through a little tube isn't going to affect it. And then my job is to kind of come in on the other side and go, okay, now let's talk about the other things we know that are related to inflammatory bowel disease, talking about that multifactorial causes of IBD and flares in IBD. So we need to try to get down some other things and try to see where we can maybe make some changes to make, to give your gut the best chance at functioning in a way that works for you. So I'm looking at stress, sleep, exercise, what is going on with this person? How are they coping with having this disease? And can we change the way the person is even interpreting their symptoms? Can we help this person cope with this so that there's less struggle there so that they can live with this the best possible way? This is is so important what you're saying, because a lot of times we worry so much about the disease and that could make it worse or the condition that we have. We're so fixated on it. And the mind is such a powerful thing. Sure. Um, And I'm sure you've done a lot of research in the power of the mind in um, health conditions like IBD. Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, and we can, the, if you look at the data, there's all kinds of data out there that'll show you things like predicting pain symptoms, which is completely common. That's a natural part of being a human, right? We develop this wonderful mind that plans, predicts, and prepares because it's kept our species alive for so long. And with this, like if someone is having a, a symptom like urgency, it is completely helpful to try to predict that and then organize our schedule around it. But with pain and urgency and stuff, we can actually induce stress by predicting the symptoms. So I always make these like kind of comments to people, you know, if I came up to you and said, hey, I'm going to drive you two hours over to Cleveland real quick and I'll be there tomorrow. You know, we can see if people start predicting, well, I couldn't be in the car that long. I would have to know every bathroom on the way. And those are normal parts of having this disease, but they cause a lot of stress, which then affects the body. And so we have to start working with some of that. Yeah. And this brings me to, we're so excited. You really did a great job on the online course that really is a primer for patients and their, and their loved ones, as well as for providers who have patients that have just been diagnosed with IBD. And this is on GI On Demand, our education platform. And we're so fortunate to have this wonderful course by, led by Dr. Loop. But can you, can you share some of the highlights of what patients or whoever is taking this course could expect to um, gain from, from going through it? Sure, absolutely. You know, I think the biggest take home message of this course is starting to understand us as this complete system. We're not just, you know, intestines. We're this whole system and everything's wired together. And we start seeing that when we look at like some of the data around inflammatory bowel disease, that everything a human being goes through affects our gut. That, you know, if we're stressed at work, it tends to start changing the functioning of the gut. And not only that, it changes the way our brain interpret some of the sensations being sent up from the gut. And the course does a pretty good job of directing this, seeing how connected the gut is to the rest of the body. And that being said, how it can 
start leading to or helping the development of these conditions and we end up labeling it anxiety and depression because like I was saying, there's it's kind of like a bi-directional relationship there, right? Where all these symptoms make me anxious, which is completely normal, but then I can't do as much as well. And that can lead to some feelings of depression. And then we even go into in the course talking about like the gut microbiome and some of the emerging research there that's even starting yeah. to show up that maybe the gut microbiome might have an effect on our mood and memory in and of itself. I think the big takeaway is just seeing how hardwired the gut is to the rest of the human body and how it, everything works together and we're one system and we really need to address people that way. Well, you're really humble. Look, I'm going to just break it down for people listening right now. Dr. Loop in his course, he doesn't sugarcoat anything. I mean, we deal with the issues that uh, are, are so common in patients, you know, we get diagnosed, you're freaking out. Let's like, be honest here. And Dr. Loop does a fabulous job of taking us through those reactions, those responses, making us feel that they're normal and, and that we're going to be okay. And that's the beauty of this course is that it really, it doesn't sugarcoat it. This is not fun. It's not fun to have IBD. It's not. However, there's hope and there's the ability to manage your condition based on some of these behavioral health factors that Dr. Loop brings in. And what I love about this course is that it doesn't just, you know, tell us stuff that doesn't make sense. It, it really, it speaks to the patient who, and the caregiver who is, who's just diagnosed with this. And, and it sets up what you might have to expect. It goes through possible surgery options. Yep. And, but it, it, it doesn't freak you out. You're not scared. You almost, when you have more information, you could be a better decision maker, right? Yes. And, and I think it's important to understand that just because you have the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, that doesn't mean life stops. Yes. Right. That we can find ways to have a life even with these diagnoses. And yes, they are going to introduce a lot of complexity into life. And it's not always pleasant. And we do have to sometimes pause and take stop depending on what's going on. But we can always find a way to get back to life. And we just need to work with people to help them find that. Sometimes it's hard when we're by ourselves. We don't necessarily yes. see the way. But when we work with people and we go through some of these skills, we talk about what's going on, we can find ways to maybe get back to doing these things that create this valuable and meaningful life and, you know, the question I always bring it back to when I'm working with people is, you know, do you have IBD or does IBD have you? Oh, and you brought up a great point about not being alone. What are some of the organizations for patients that you would recommend for support, for camaraderie? And again, we're not trying to sugarcoat anything. We know this is a difficult disease, but there are patients that have IBD, Crohn's or colitis that are doing great things, have achieved great mm -hmm. things. Um, in life and it hasn't stopped them? You know, the first, our courses are one of the places you can go to start getting information, but also the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation does a fantastic job and they have all kinds of information, not just about what is Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but the psychosocial functioning, the, um, which includes relationship functioning. They have a great section on there about what does this mean even for intimacy and whatnot that I've been diagnosed with this? What does surgical options look like? And how do I connect with other people near me? You know, we run groups as part of the Cleveland Clinic. And one of the first things I heard from people were talking about being alone was just that other people don't, I don't feel like other people get this that my, I'm going through this with my body and other people don't get it. And it tends to be stuff we don't want to talk about. Our bathroom habits, our bowel habits. Yeah. And I, so we started getting people together in these groups and it was pretty amazing. Once you took down the walls about what you yeah. were allowed to talk about, what got talked about and the support that people got for each other, they decided they were running it without me and took it even outside of our group and turned it into a support group separate from the Cleveland Clinic. Um, but yeah. And it's so great. And we have this other organization. We did a fabulous interview with Melanie and of Kochi, the color of Crohn's and chronic illness. And she's really bringing a lot of visibility to underserved patients such as African-Americans, Hispanic, and people that haven't typically been associated with IBD. But I think it also has to do with the behaviors, right? And the socioeconomic and 
who this information is reaching. And I think, you know, we're trying to do a better job of reaching those patients that normally wouldn't be typically thought of as IBD patients. And she's doing an amazing job of really raising awareness. It's really important to have those, um, those outlets for all types of patients, I think. Absolutely. I think that, the, you know, there needs to be more of that work done, highlighting some of the groups that have not received much as much attention. Um, there is some data out there that, you know, people of color are less likely to be insured and less likely to get care even when they do develop IBD and less likely to be diagnosed appropriately. So I think that that's absolutely an important part that there may be groups of people that we're missing and that aren't getting the full amounts of care that they could be getting. Do you, do you see that in your clinic of, in terms of a behavioral health or GI psychology type of angle, do you see patients coming in who maybe have color or normally or typically not identified as a, typical IBD patient coming in with struggling, like they didn't know that they could have this disease and they were surprised. Yeah, we do. We see that. And, you know, the other part of that is they didn't know that there was resources available once they did get plugged in. And a lot of times these people have not been exposed to like a psychologist or a dietitian. So working with those patient populations to make sure that they know what care is available and that they know, you know, what we can do and then getting the comfort level of working maybe with a psychologist or a dietitian or all of the above to make sure this person gets the appropriate care that we can provide. Well, before we go, I just want you to give three tips for providers on why, you know, uh, they should recommend this video to their patients. Um, I, I think for providers that this is a great way to introduce patients to some of the things that happen outside of what we normally think of with um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, that it introduces people to psychosocial factors, it gets people to think about it. There are some resources at the end that can even help patients find a GI um, behavioral health provider. Um, I know there's a little bit of fear sometimes from providers that if I'm going to open this can that I may not have time to like talk through all of this with my patient. So this is a great place to send patients over to get some of that information and maybe get some of those resources. Um, I think that's the biggest thing for uh, providers. I think I covered three in there, but yeah, you probably um, covered 20, you know, okay. <laughs> no, this is great. So patients, if you go to education.giondemand.com and look for Dr. Loop's course, I can't wait to see the responses uh, to folks that have gone through it and it's available at no charge. Um, and you could go through it on demand at your leisure. You can stop, come back to it, uh, take notes. So again, Dr. Loop, thanks for your great work. And we look forward to um, talking with you again soon. Anytime. Love being here. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.